Welcome to the third video of the series, where we will focus on creating textures. We'll create a parametric padded jacket material that we can use on our jacket or any other garment coming from Clo. We'll use the new spline and path features of Substance Designer, along with some other techniques to create a very flexible material that we can customize extensively to create many variations. First, let's create a new substance graph and name it Jacket Material. Since this is my third material, I'll name it accordingly, but feel free to name it something that makes sense to you. Assign it a descriptive name, like plastic padding, and set the power and size to 4096 by 4096. Although this can change later, 4K is suitable for now. It's also important to set 16 bits per channel to allow for better normal and height maps without any gradation or stepping issues. Use the standard PBR template and click on the unsaved package to link your 3D scene. Then load and drag the previously created jacket mesh into the viewport. The customizable interface in Designer allows us to view scenes at the same time as authoring materials. Let's now right-click on the jacket mesh in the Explorer to get to the Mesh Map Baking Interface. We need to make a UV mask. Let's select 8K as the resolution and leave the format as PNG. We can now add a UV to SVG Baker. This will convert the UV map of the mesh to an SVG vector. You can select the destination folder to save it where you want. We want the color mode to be uniform. With this configuration, the UV islands or UV shells will appear gray against the transparent background. Here is the result. Let's drag and drop it from the explorer into the graph. Hit tab and select input. We do this to make sure our material will be able to read the UVs of any mesh in Painter. The baked UVs here serve as a placeholder for this. When using this material in Painter, it will conform to any mesh, dynamically reading its UV map. First, we need to add an item in the Usage section and set the usage to Mesh UV Mask. Give it the identifier Mesh underscore, UV underscore, mask, and a descriptive name for the label. Set the SVG to grayscale and create a switch including both the baked UV of the current mesh in Designer and the dynamic UV map input that will read the mesh's UVs in Painter. Let's first expose the switch parameter. And let's go ahead and configure the switch by creating labels for it so that we can switch between the two modes. These settings will be reflected in Painter. As a side note, you can double-click on the SVG, export it as a bitmap, re-import or relink it to the material, and then drag and drop it onto the UV mask input. This will create a preview map for the UV mask. This is a convenient way to test the input nodes. Our next step is to create a chain of edge detect nodes to outline the UV mask of the model. By experimenting with the width and roundness, we'll create an outline based on the UV edges, repeating this process with different settings and duplicating edge detect nodes. We'll work on creating various layers of outlines, adding thickness and combining them. First, plug in an edge detect with an edge width of 1.63 and an edge roundness of 0.42. Connect a second edge detect, this time giving it an edge width of 7.11 and an edge roundness of 0.5. This drives into a third edge detect node, which is identical to the one above it. Then blend the two results together in multiply mode. 
We can preview this by displaying the result in the base color channel. We'll then repeat this process multiple times, each time with different widths and edge roundness settings. Connect your switch grayscale node to yet another edge detect and set its edge width to 12.67 and its edge roundness to zero. Duplicate the edge detect with a thin line from above and connect it to your new edge detect in the third row. Then blend the previous blended outcome with the latest edge detect in multiply mode. Repeat this process once more, connecting another edge detect to your switch grayscale, changing the edge width and roundness to 18.69 and 1, and connecting it to a copy of an edge detect from above. Then blend everything together with a final blend in multiply mode. At this point, you can visualize the effect and make any necessary adjustments. We're using this in the color channel for now just to visualize it. But the goal is to create a height map out of it so that we can then use it as a displacement map in Unreal to create the effect of a padded jacket. From your final blend, you want to transition into a bevel. The purpose here is to soften the black lines, creating a gradual kind of bump, one that's more blended. To achieve this, set the distance to something minute, like 0.001, and the smoothing to a larger value, like 1. Drag a selection around your graph so far, and put a frame around it. You can call this padding. Let's apply this as a height map. To get displacement in the 3D view, go to the Materials menu, select the jacket material, and in its properties, increase the tessellation factor to something substantial like 64. You also want to modify the height scale to a larger value, previewing the result that will later be applied to the jacket as a displacement map in Unreal. By plugging it into the color channel as well, you can verify that it functions correctly. The preview is looking good. Let's see how we can improve this. Unplug this now from the base color and plug it into ambient occlusion. You can also use a dedicated ambient occlusion node like HBAO or RTAO, but our bevel node output will also work just fine here. You can use a light gray uniform color for the color channel to preview the result more easily. The occlusion might be a little too strong here, but we will adjust it later. Let's now make some stitching for our padded jacket, starting from our bevel node. A great way to do stitching is by using the new path and spline nodes. Paths are a new feature in Designer, one of the new vector tools which allow working with vector shapes. This particular tool, called Mask to Paths, takes outlines and converts them to a set of paths. Even though it's connected to a bevel node here, it reads the edges accurately. Decrease the decimate path value to 0.0001 to make the parts more accurate. To be able to scatter elements along these paths, we need to first convert them to splines. So we'll first use a Paths to Splines node, and then connect this to a Scatter on Spline grayscale node, which scatters shapes along splines. This is working great, but we want stitches instead of disks. So let's start doing that by creating the shape of our stitch first. Start by creating a radial gradient, and inverting it using an Invert Grayscale node. You will also need a Fibers 1 node. Now, plug the fibers into the background of a blend and the gradient into its opacity. This will give you a round stitch. Now, you can make the shape narrower by using a Transformation 2D node and dragging the handles in the 2D view. Set the tiling mode to Absolute and no tiling so that the shape doesn't repeat. Now that the stitch is ready, you can plug it into pattern input number 1 of the Scatter on Spline node. 
set the scatter pattern to pattern input, the shape spacing to 0.001 and the scale to 0.001. Now you have stitching along all of the outlines which we previously created. You can preview this by plugging it into the color output. By holding Shift and Control, pressing the right mouse button and dragging, you can rotate the light source. Now, plug this into a blend node, along with a uniform grayscale color, to produce the base color map. Change the duplicate amount for double stitching along the seams and play with the offsets until you get something you like. This will also be plugged into a normal node to generate a normal map, creating a slight protrusion on the stitching. Then convert the grayscale scatter on spline node to a color node through a gradient map and use a color blend node with a uniform color to give your stitching a custom color. We also need to create a mask here to separate the stitching from the fabric in the final blend node for the color output. You can do this by using a histogram scan after your scatter node and dragging the position up to 1 before plugging it into the opacity input of the final blend for the color output. You can now change the uniform color of the stitching and this will be superimposed on the color of the fabric. You can now tidy up the graph by selecting all the stitching nodes and creating a frame around them labeled stitching. You can also reorganize the graph slightly to enhance its legibility. Dot nodes can help you tidy up your node connections. We'll now use a similar technique to the one we used for the stitching to create puckering and creases. Let's start by duplicating the mask to paths, the path to splines and the scatter along spline grayscale nodes. As I want the new section to start right under the stitching section, I'll temporarily go backwards with my connection here, even though this is generally wrong. And I'll come back to this topic near the end of the tutorial, when I will be tidying up everything to introduce portal nodes. We now need a second shape to scatter along the paths. Start with the starburst node and continue by adjusting the number and branches and blurring amount setting the branches to 10 and the blur amount to 5. Next, set the randomness to 0.19 and adjust the sizes, minimum to 0.06, max to 1.8. The size variation will be set to 0.61. The exact numbers may vary based on your experimentation. Set the tiling mode to absolute and no tiling and connect the starburst to a warp node to introduce a slight distortion, employing Gaussian noise for the distortion input. You don't want the warp effect to be too intense, so modify the properties, adjusting the scale to 12, the disorder to 1, and toning down the warp node's intensity to 0.4. Then reposition it closer to your scatter node and connect the warp into pattern input number 1. You can now adjust the scatter node parameters. We'll modify the shape spacing to 0.003, the offset center to 0, the scale to 0 0.1, and the scale random to 1. Feel free to play around with the values here. The settings will impact the height to produce a puckering effect. Now let's balance the results with a Levels node and invert it with an Invert Grayscale node. You can keep reorganizing the graph with dot nodes to enhance legibility. Drive the result into a blend and use the Add mode to add your stitching on top of the packering. The packering is not strictly just packering here, 
but also larger creases around the padding. You can preview this now if you connect it to your normal output. Feel free to experiment more with the stitching parameters, even though we will expose many of these parameters so that we can change them at any point later. The idea is to place the stitching inside the grooves formed by the existing height map. To visualize this more easily, connect the uniform color into the ambient occlusion channel to eliminate the darker areas. A bright gray color will enable a clearer view of how everything is working without any color distractions. After finishing adjusting the stitching parameters, preview the stitching to ensure it's correct. Let's now return to the padding and insert a levels node after the bevel, duplicating it for both the ambient occlusion and height output channels. This will allow you to control the ambient occlusion and the height separately. Next, select all the nodes for the packering, frame them and reposition them for legibility. Let's verify all the outputs now. And let's begin exposing parameters, since we're close to the final result. This process involves labeling and exposing various elements to have them available when using the material in Painter and other software. Let's start with a Levels node that goes into the Ambient Occlusion output. Go into the separate parameters for the histogram and check which values are the ones that affect your results in a meaningful way. In this case, it will be the level out low that you want to expose by clicking the icon next to it and selecting Expose as new graph. Leave the identifier as it is, put in the label AO amount and leave the rest of the default settings in. Doing this will allow you to control the parameter later in Painter. Go into the Levels node for the height and again Test the parameters to see which ones affect your result. In this case, it will be the level out high that affects the padding. So expose this. Set the label to height or something a little more meaningful like puffiness, as this controls the puffiness of the jacket. Keep going through your nodes to see what else might be useful to expose. It will certainly be useful to expose the spacing of the stitching, the duplicate amount of the stitching and the offset of the stitching. The scale will also be useful. Give every exposed parameter a descriptive name so that you know what they are about later. In this case, let's call it stitch size. Next, expose the uniform color for the stitches as well as the main surface of the jacket. At this point, Let's tidy up our graph a little more. Let's go to the Levels node following the Packering Scatter node and expose some parameters that will allow us to control the packering. Go into the separate values and check which ones affect the packering and which ones can be useful. Expose the level in low. Call it Packering Spread and expose the level out high and call it Packering Amount. You can select any name you like, as long as it makes sense to you and hopefully to everyone else who will use the material. Go into the Normal, expose the Intensity and call it Normal Intensity. Also expose the Uniform Color for the Roughness and the uniform color for the metallic. To test all the parameters you've already exposed, click on the background of the graph and go into the Preview tab of the Input Parameter section. Back in the Parameters tab, we can organize all of them into groups. You can give the groups names like Stitching, Padding, Puckering and Technical. This will make it easier to access them in Painter. Let's do some housekeeping now and optimize our nodes for better performance. 
We want to strive for efficiency here by reducing the processing footprint of the nodes as much as possible without losing visible quality. Set the output size of all uniform color nodes to absolute and the resolution to 16 by 16. Also set the output size of all the graphics that are scattered to absolute and set the resolution to something very low without affecting their quality too much. We can afford to go to very low resolutions with some of the graphics as they are repeated many times over so their size in the combined full maps will be very small. Let's also configure the scatter node's output size to be relative to the parent, ensuring it doesn't rely on the input, which can be really small. The parent will determine the size of all nodes whose input is set to parent input, as it will align with the resolution of the whole document. For example, if the resolution of the document or export is set at 8K, then this is the resolution that those particular nodes will utilize. OK, we have now finished the material, so let's see what we can do to tidy up the graph a little more and make it more legible. The first thing that has to happen here, that's long overdue, is to take this ugly backward connection and convert it to a portal node. The portal node is really a function of the dot node that allows us to remotely connect nodes so that we can improve the flow of our graphs. In this instance, I click on the outgoing dot node and give it the name padding. I then select the connection to the incoming node and delete it. This will turn the outgoing and incoming dot nodes into portal nodes. You can tell by the wave graphic next to the dot node, as well as the name over or next to it. You can move the outgoing node anywhere you like, and it makes sense to move it into the padding frame. This has allowed us to stack our frames vertically without having too many connections getting in the way. To reuse the portal node, you simply place a dot node anywhere you like, and from its properties window, you can select from the drop down menu the name of the outgoing connection you want to use with it. And you can reuse portals as much as you like. For example, you can reuse the padding portal in the stitching section as you need it to go into the masked paths node. To do this, place a dot node within the stitching frame, click on it, select padding as input portal from its properties, and connect it to mask to paths. One more example. Say that we want to insert some kind of blur between the levels and the invert grayscale of the puckering to soften its transition from its center to its edges. We could then create an outgoing portal from the bevel node of the padding. Give it a name like padding bevel. And place a non-uniform blur grayscale in between the levels and the invert grayscale. As this node needs a blur map to work correctly, we can connect our bevel through a portal node, select padding bevel, and then connect it to the blur map input. This will give us a non-linear blur effect that is more intense at the peak of the padding and fades out toward the folds of the padding. Let's expose this too, so that we can control its intensity later. Call it something like puckering blur and make sure that the values are within the range that you want. In this case, from 0 to 1. Let's also put it in the packering group of parameters. You can test these effects in the previous section. So here's our graph, optimized and tidy for use in Painter or any other program that supports substance materials. Before we process this material in Painter and export maps for Unreal, let's first also create, in the next video, a material for the dress.